Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's edition of Behind the Code. This week, we're talking all about the new uh, Google Analytics v3 mobile SDKs. Uh, my name is Andrew Wales. I'm uh, on the developer relations team for Google Analytics. Uh, and with me in studio is Jim Kutugno. Um, he's a software engineer who works on our mobile app SDKs. Um, and he's been around since the beginning, more or less. Well, not quite the beginning, but pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close to it. Um, so he's a veteran. We've been working on these SDKs for a long time. And he's been behind a lot of the changes that are in V3. Um, so we're lucky to have him here. And we'll walk through uh, what's new, give you some pointers about uh, migrating and, and what to look for as well. Um, so if you go ahead and take a look at the agenda for the show, um, I'll give you a quick overview on what's new. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about get, set, and send, which are really at the core of the V3 SDK, these three methods. Um, we'll talk a little bit about session management and how that works in V3, um, what's changed, and also what's staying the same. Um, and then we'll take just a quick look at e-commerce, because the model's changed a little bit. So we want to give you just a quick uh, heads up about what's new in V3. Um, then also, at the end, we'll make time for Q&A. Um, a lot of you posted some really great questions to our moderator page, so we'll try to get through as many of those as we can. So let's jump right in. Um, so what's new in V3? Um, so there's really four main things that are new here. Um, the first and probably the, the most noticeable thing um, is that the APIs are now more aligned across all the different platforms. Um, so you'll notice that uh, Android, iOS, um, and also Analytics.js, our web uh, our library for, for JavaScript, is they're all very much similar in how you use uh, or how you get, set, and send data. And we'll, we'll go into that a little bit further, I think. Um, the second point, second big thing that's new is that there's more flexibility in setting and sending data. And we'll go through that uh, as well later on in the show. Um, there's now forward compatibility with new hit types and parameters. Um, and we'll show you some examples of how you can send um, any kind of parameter uh, in the via our SDKs uh, to the GA endpoint. And then the fourth thing is that there are some new debugging features. Um, notably, we've added a dry run flag so that you can enable this during testing so that you don't send test data into your production reports. Um, and then we've also replaced the debug flag with this logger class, which is actually a little bit more flexible. Um, if you want to learn more about the debugging features on this, go ahead and check out the um, migration guide on the developer site, which is developers.google.com slash analytics. We're not going to cover them in today's presentation, but there's a lot of documentation there. So go check it out. So let's take a closer look at um, the first point. Um, API is now aligned across web and mobile, across all these different platforms. Um, Jim, can you give us kind of an overview of sort of what the I what the impetus was for going back and refactoring to make things more aligned across these different platforms? So what we wanted to do w with this was to kind of unify um, the way you do your tracking calls across GA, uh, whether you use uh, Android or iOS platforms for mobile apps, or whether you do websites. So we didn't want you to have to learn uh, a new way of doing things uh, with each platform. So. Um, so uh, we kind of followed the Analytics.js route with uh, basically three methods for your tracking needs, get, set, and send. And that's yeah. what you see here. Yeah. Cool. And I think we'll see a bunch of examples of this later as we walk through some of, uh, some of the later slides. Um, and also, really quickly, I wanted to touch on the forward compatibility with new hit types. Um, so how does the V3 SDK actually enable this kind of forward compatibility? Um, so it, the way it enables it is it's, it basically lets you pass in any parameter name and any parameter value through the set or send methods. Uh, and so um, previously in the V2 SDK, we had kind of predefined all the parameters that uh, were enabled for the SDK to, to report uh, you know, analytics data through the measurement protocol. So we, we stripped all that out so that you could um, set anything you want, anytime you want. Um, and, and this will enable you to add new parameters, uh, new hit types as, as uh, they become available in analytics in general. Mm -hmm. Cool. So would this also let you, for example, could you now send um, like web page views from the app SDK? You could. You could. You have yes. the flexibility to do yes. that now. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So that's cool. Um, OK. Um, great. And actually, here's just some, here's an iOS code snippet as well. You can just see that um, we'll talk a little bit more about the um, dictionary builder and the map builder classes later in the show. But um, just so you can see a quick example of how you might uh, set um, or how you might send an arbitrary parameter. Um, 
in V3. And also how that shows up in the hit that's generated from that. Cool, so now that we've gone through uh, an overview of what's new, um, let's kind of get more into the meat uh, of V3. And a lot of that is going to be around using these get, set, and send methods and understanding how those work. Um, so let's start with just a quick overview. Um, Jim, can you give us kind of like an understanding of what the change is from V2? Because I know in V2 we had a lot of so convenience v methods. Right, right, right. So V2, we originally started, <coughs> excuse me, with um, uh, method calls uh, that started with track, actually, not just send. Mm -hmm. So you had a track view, a track event, track exception. Uh, and then we changed those to send to be more, uh, you know, more in line with what we were doing. Um, um, but for V3, uh, as I said before, to try and, and um, align with the other platforms, the other client platforms, we got rid of all those special purpose send methods and replaced them with send. Mm -hmm. So instead of send view, we have send, and then you would pass in the, a map of parameters or a dictionary in the iOS case mm -hmm. that uh, represented your, v, your app view hit, and then same with event, transaction, exception, etc. Um, and then set, we had um, we had very specific set methods for things like setting campaign, custom dimensions, right. custom metrics, and those all are replaced by a general set method, sure. uh, which will take the field name and the value. And then forget, uh, this is a little bit new to the SDKs in that you could actually query the values of the, the tracker objects that you've previously set or um, or are, are will be set for us on mm -hmm. your behalf. So pretty much any field can be set or retrieved from the tracker, right? That's correct, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk, I guess, um, let's start with send, because that's probably the command that most people are going to be using yeah. most often. Um, how does it work, basically? <laughs> so send <laughs> sends very straightforward. It takes a, a map uh, for the Android SDK and the iOS SDK would be a dictionary yeah. of parameters. Parameters. Uh, have a name and a value, and they're both treated as strings. So we no longer deal with uh, various object types like uh, integers or floats or longs. Everything is is um, a string uh, for the send parameter or send uh, method. Sorry, um, and and then um, so uh, when you call send, what happens is um, the values stored in the track are merged with the values provided in that map. Um, the values in the map will take precedence over what has previously right. set in the tracker. And then the, the hit will be queued for dispatch. Um, and then you don't have to worry about it at that point anymore. Right, right. One, of the, one of the cool things in V3 that I definitely wanted to highlight for people was that it's actually um, pretty easy to build these maps of parameter value. Right. We have these map builder convenience classes. And yeah. Can you talk so a little bit about that. Yeah. So uh, because we took away the convenience method calls on the tracker, send event, send exception, we felt uh, it, it would be very useful to provide some way to conveniently build various hit types so that you didn't have to remember which parameters needed to be filled in for each type of hit. Mm -hmm. And so the map builder class was created um, for that purpose. So the map builder has create methods for each uh, of the common hit types. And that create method basically takes all the parameters that you would normally set, uh, set up for that hit. So mm -hmm. for event, for example, you have category, action, label, and value. Right. Um, so as an example, we have like a we were sending an event that uh, somebody touches a button to play a video, for example. This yeah. might be an example of that. Right. So here's a perfect example of an event. There's a couple of things to point out in this example. Uh, one, first off, the map builder actually follows the builder pattern. So, so those of you who are familiar with that pattern will probably recognize this. So you create the map builder class um, using the, one of the create methods, and then you could optionally set uh, new uh, additional parameters. So here, for example, we're going to set custom dimension uh, 2 uh, to a value of watch the video. And then when you're finally done with it, you can <coughs> get your map by calling build. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're all set. And you just pass that to send, and you're done. Cool. So you can set, I mean, it's not just this example is custom dimensions, but you could set anything else you need to before you're ready to build. And That's correct. And send it all in one go. That's correct, yes. That's cool. Um, oh, and then here's a, so it's, it's the same for iOS, right? It's, it's yes. you're building dictionaries and the class is GAI Dictionary Builder. 
Yeah, so we use the builder pattern here. Um, with iOS, you don't have maps, but you have dictionaries mm -hmm. are very much the same or very similar. Um, so, yes. Same thing. Cool. Uh, let's talk about the set method. How does that work? Uh, so when you set, uh, the set method will make a, a permanent adjustment to your tracker model. So the tracker keeps track of all the, the parameters and their values that you've set. Um, uh, it's persisted and it'll stay in the tracker until you um, get rid of it, really. So, to so that way, if you have certain fields that you don't want to set that you want to be set or on every hit, and but you don't want to, you know, set it in the map builder every time. Right. You can simply just call set. Examples: um, the value is going to be uh, going to be persistent in the tracker. It'll show up on every hit right. unless the map you pass into your send call overrides the value. Right, because it'll right. take precedence right. over what's set in the tracker. And if you don't want to set that value anymore, what you can do is pass null or nil in the iOS case as the value and that field will get cleared out effectively. OK. Cool. I think it's an important thing to, to point out <coughs> that when you set something on the tracker, it's gonna, that value is going to persist uh, sort of indefinitely until you destroy yeah. that tracker or until you override that value. That's right. Um, That's right. So I think I know we were talking about before this, like there are definitely some good places where you'd want to set certain values um, directly on the tracker that are going to be applied to a lot of hits. Um, so one of the examples that I know we talked about was, um, for example, here, um, if you, whenever a view or a screen gets loaded, um, it's convenient to set the screen name uh, first, and then you can send all your hits after that. So in this example, we set the um, screen name field to home screen uh, when the view loads. And then we're going to send an app view, and we're going to send an event. And both of those hits are going to contain that screen name. I only had to set it once. That's right. Yeah. And, and this is very important. Um, just like in the web case, if you want your events to be tied to a particular screen, right. this is how you have to do it. Otherwise, right. your events will not be attributed to that screen. To a particular screen, right. Yeah. Um, or I know some other good examples were um, setting settings like uh, anonymized IP or setting a sample rate. Um, because those are tracker level settings, right? Right. So when you set those, you probably want them to stay set yeah. for the duration of your tracker. Right. And right. so that those are good candidates for a set call, set uh, call in the tracker. Yeah. And then there are some bad places to <laughs> use this, right? Places um, basically when you when you use this to set fields that you really are only going to send once. Um, I think that's probably where most people will run into trouble. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so I know the example we talked about was. Um, an event action. So if you have some kind of handler um, and you happen to set uh, an event action or any of these like event uh, fields, those are really only going to be applied. They, those should only be applied to that one event. Um, but if you set them right and then send other events, um, if you don't provide values, you, you could well basically you're going to end up setting those event fields with every hit, which is probably not what you want. Right. right yeah. So uh, yeah, this is a bad example of, of what you would use the tracker set method for. Right. That's, that's and right. then another uh, mistake I know I made once you pointed out earlier was, and we'll talk about the session control uh, field a little bit later, but that would be one, um, you have this ability to start or stop a session by setting this field. And if you set that field directly on the tracker, yep. you're going to be starting a new session with every hit. Which yeah, which you do not want. A disaster, right? That's right. Yep. And I made that mistake. Do not so want that. Please don't make that mistake. Cool. OK, so lastly, we talked about send, set, and then the last one's get. So the tracker is, is a model, and, and you could use it to retain values of, of the various parameters that, that you want to send to Google Analytics. So the get method lets you query those, uh, those values that you've set previously. So it, I guess the other thing point to bring up here is that um, if you haven't, the, the, the tracker has this concept of what we call uh, default values for certain fields. So mm -hmm. there's some fields that you really want to always set in the application world, things like the application name, the application version, right. uh, the client ID is another good example. Um, so we'll, pre we'll fill those in for you if you don't set them using the set method or pass them through, uh, through the map mm -hmm. uh, in the send call. And so if you call git on those particular fields, um, we'll give you the value we will provide if, if you haven't 
set the value. So, right. so for example, if you want to, if you're curious to know what application name we're going to send with each hit, yeah. call get on the application name field. Got it. And you'll see it. So, what about a field that doesn't automatically get set? Like, if you called get on like campaign source, is it an empty string? Yeah, it'll it'll be I, I believe no. No. Okay. So or nil. Or nil in the iOS case, correct? Um, and we so we should definitely get a list of those default values. We'll make yeah. sure to get that on DevSec. So I think right now it's not there. Yeah. Um, but we'd like to see that get posted. Uh, the, the final note here is client. I know se several uh, uh, folks using the SDK have asked for us to, to expose the client ID that we send. And, and we've done that with the V3 SDK. Uh, there's one uh, very important caveat here is all these calls are non-blocking calls, except for uh, when you call get to get the client ID. You may block. So um, especially early in the life cycle of the application. So you won't want to make this call in your initialization code on the main UI thread. Is that going to block because it's reading from? It's, yes, because it's reading. The client ID is persisted on uh, the persistent store on the device. Right, right. And it takes a little time to read up. Cool. Um, and then lastly, so I think throughout, as you call these different methods, you're going to be providing fields pretty much with every call. So I th thought it deserved maybe just a slide to talk about um, what these, like how you access these fields. Um, so we, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. OK. So we provided um, some classes that um, define constants for, the, for all the fields that you would commonly use in the application tracking uh, world. Um, and they're in the fields.java uh, class. Uh, and there's some examples there on the slide. Mm -hmm. In iOS, it's a GAI fields uh, header file. Um, <coughs> we've also provided uh, convenience methods for creating uh, parameter field names for custom dimensions and metrics. As, as you know, those <coughs> are repeated fields. They have they're like index, so you have custom right. dimension one, custom dimension two, right. et cetera, et cetera. Cool. And so we have some convenience methods that will build the parameter name for you, so you don't have to figure it out for yourself. Cool. And then the last one is sort of what we talked about earlier, where you can um, use this like ampersand syntax to get, set, or send any parameters, right? Yeah. So um, the the tracker understands the ampersand syntax, and so basically, if you look at your measurement protocol, uh, all the all the the uh, parameters there um, can be can be set using the ampersand. Cool. And so this ampersand T, for example, would be the hit type. For a hit type, right. So this would be like an example for a new hit type that we release in the future. Right. But you could send, as you said, any measurement protocol yes. parameter this way. Let's talk about what's new uh, in session management in V3. Um, and also what's the same. Because some things I know have changed, and some yeah, things are the same. Um, so Jim, why don't you walk us through um, everything we need to know, really, about <laughs> session management in V3. I don't know if it's going to be everything. Well, but a lot hopefully, of work, you know. hopefully we'll clear the air a little bit about sessions. Sure. Okay. So um, in Universal Analytics, uh, there was a change. This is like outside the the realm of the app SDKs, but uh, session management moved from the clients to the back end. Um, so the back end for Universal Analytics, which includes the V2 SDK and the V3 SDK, the session management is handled by the back end. And the way it does that is it looks for a gap in time from one uh, hit to the next. And when that gap is large enough, it will declare the end of session and start a new session. So the default value was 30 minutes uh, initially. And that default value is now configurable through the management UI um, on the Google Analytics uh, website. And if you look at the slide, you'll see um, a screenshot of, of what uh, the page looks like that lets you control the session timeout. Session timeout is kind of on the upper right of the picture there. Yeah, and then campaign timeouts there as well. Yeah, campaign timeouts there as well. That's correct, yeah. OK. So in, in the V2 SDK, um, in order uh, to get around that 30 minute uh, window, which was the only window that the back end would support initially, uh, we decided to add support uh, in the SDKs for controlling sessions. And we did that um, through um, a, a, a basically a property or a flag session control. And behind the scenes, what that flag did was uh, send a parameter uh, called session control, or ampersand SC is the, the, the name. And it would send a start uh, when it felt a new session should begin. 
And what it did is it, it the way we did it in V2 is we just decided that if the app was sitting in the background for any for a certain length of time, I think the default was 30 seconds, mm -hmm. we would um, set that uh, parameter up and say, hey, we ha we need a new session. We implemented that in Easy Tracker on the Android and in the GAI Tracker uh, class that was returned to you uh, when you asked for one on iOS. Um, the other the other thing to note here is that when the trackers were first created uh, in both iOS and Android, we would also set that session control parameter to start and, and send it with the first hit. Right. So that's how it worked in V2, and this was all to give you a finer control than that 30-minute window, which is what uh, initially was the only way you could break sessions in the back end. Right, right. So given now that you can parameterize, uh, you can control that window um, to a great degree uh, with the, the UI, management UI, uh, in the application, the analytics application, mm -hmm. um, we decided to kind of step back from it in V3 and clean things up. If you want to flip over next time, sure, sure. So in, in Android in, in V3 for Android, uh, the tracker class is no longer going to set the session control parameter to start ever for you. You can do it yourself. Uh, it's just just another parameter. You can again, don't use the set command, but you can set right. it through the send command uh, in the in the map builder. Uh, Easy Tracker, kind of a side point, but the Easy Tracker now extends Tracker. Mm -hmm. So you can treat Easy Tracker just like your Tracker, you call and get, set, and send. And the Easy Tracker for Android will continue to manage sessions as it did in V2. Okay. So there's still a parameter to, that you can control uh, that will determine how long the app sits in the background before mm -hmm. um, a session control flag starts. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, so for, for people who are using um, Easy Tracker on Android and V2 right now to handle session management. For them, there's probably no noticeable change in V3, right? So the one noticeable change is when they first start. I, no, I guess you're right. So when the Easy Tracker first starts, it will assume a new session because the time, whatever time period you put in there, will, will have expired basically. I see. Yep. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. But for those people who are not using Easy Tracker in V3, they should note, especially this top point, that the Tracker class. Um, will no longer set session control flag to start when the tracker is created. That's correct. It's a very important point. And if, you don't, if you're not aware of that, you might be a little, a little bit concerned because your session numbers uh, won't quite look the same. Won't look the same. As between V3 and V2, yeah. For iOS, um, again, as part of this alignment, we wanted to make all the SDKs behave the same. And so we removed the session management code, which was in the GAI tracker class. Mm -hmm. Um, from iOS, and, and again, like in Android, we no longer set the session control parameter to start when the tracker is first created. Mm -hmm. um, if you need, um, you, if you need to do this manually, uh, which might be a good idea, um, you can look at hooking up to the notifications. UI application did become active, um, and will resign active. And what you would do there is, did become active, you would look to see if a certain length of time had passed. Mm -hmm. Um, which you would set up using the will resign active notification or right. callback. And then you can d decide to set session, uh, the session control parameter to start or not mm -hmm. on the next hit based on, on the values you have there. So. For Android users um, who are not using Easy Tracker, but they do want um, the session control flag to get set um, to start uh, when the app launches, for example. Um, is the way would one way to do that be to subclass application in Android and do it in the? Well, operator? remember, remember, you don't want to call set on the tracker. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Not don't set it on the tracker. Right. But you might want to um, set it on a uh, screen view map. For example. Right. Right. So yeah. So your map that you pass in would have it set right. or not. Okay. So let's take a quick look at what's new um, with e-commerce uh, in version three of the SDKs. Um, it's actually a pretty small change. Um, basically, you need to, whereas before, you would basically send um, your transaction object in one hit. Um, you would kind of create this transaction object and then add items and then send it all in one hit. In v3, there's actually separate, you need to make separate send calls for each transaction and item. So the syntax is very much the same as um, sending app views or events in v3. So the easiest way to do it is um, to use Map Builder, and then you'd call. Um, create transaction, add everything, all the details there. 
um, build it, send it, and then do the same thing for your items, all of them. Um, one thing to, you know, as always, make sure that the transaction ID in each item um, matches up to the transaction ID that you used in the transaction hit. Um, but other than that, all the fields are the same. It's just that you need to make, make sure that you're calling send for the transaction, and then also call send individually for each item. OK, cool. So let's, uh, let's take some of your questions. Um, so the first one, um, Jim, uh, can you please explain the relationship between sessions, session duration, uh, and how active users are determined? Uh, it's kind of a big question. It is a loaded it's, question. It's, it's a universal analytics question. Yeah. Uh, but I guess I'll take a stab at kind of explaining it a little bit, and um, hopefully maybe we can get uh, some updates on the, on the, web, the website uh, that really kind of goes in this in depth. Mm -hmm. um, but so a session is, is, is basically um, a set of interactions a user has with your application. Um, that can be considered like a single visit to the application. So, um, and those sessions will be made up of one or more uh, what we call hits or beacons in, in analytics. Um, the session duration is measured more or less from the, f the time that passes between the first hit is sent or is generated and the last hit is generated. And then active users are basically the number of users who send one or more sessions in, during the particular reporting period in question. So that's kind of so if session, simple answer. If simple. session duration is, uh, what, what would happen in a session with one? So you said that we kind of, to get the duration, we look at the first hit and the last hit um, to get the duration. But what happens if there's only one hit in a session? Well, then the duration is going to be zero. It's set to zero. OK. So, um, so if you have a lot of sessions that are looking like they're zero seconds in length, that's what it is. That might be what's going on. Yeah. OK. Cool. Um, so next question. Um, could calls, uh, especially event calls, be batched uh, at dispatch time in one single request? We're looking at doing something like that, yes. OK. So I can't cool. give you any sort of commitment as to when or how, yeah. but yeah, it's been on our mind for a while. Cool. So maybe coming soon. Um, next question. Uh, is there a way to keep real-time analytics while using a sample rate of less than 100%? Well, so real-time analytics takes the same data that you send to the, the website for the reports mm -hmm. and just gives it to you a lot more quick, uh, quickly than you would get it otherwise. Right. So um, your real-time analytics uh, data should be very much the same as your report data. So uh, you know, as long as you have a, a large enough sample, um, if your sample rate's less than 100%, I think real-time can still be useful. Right. Right. Obviously, you're going to have to scale uh, the numbers in your head or whatever. So we report the raw numbers. We don't report the sampled numbers. So right. for example, if you see 10 and your sample rate is 10, you could reasonably infer that you have 100 users I of see, your app yeah, at yeah. that time. Right. So basically, the sample rate is going to just limit the number of hits that get sent from the client. But the real-time right. reporting right. isn't going to, it's not connected. I mean, it'll show all the hits that make right. it. But if your yeah. sample rate is 50%, you're only going to see one hit in real time instead of two. I guess the other important thing to point out here is that the sample rate actually uh, is based on the visitor. So a particular user mm. or visitor to your app will either report all their interactions or none of them. Or so none. it's so it's not like you'll see like half the events this user's mm. generated. Yeah, you'll see them all if the user is um, going to report based on the sample rate. Cool. Um, so I have another question here about the um, new combined Google Analytics Services SDK. Um, so with V3, um, we're sort of um, giving you analytics, but also Google Tag Manager together. Um, so the question here is, will there also be an SDK version without Google Tag Manager? Um, and they're concerned about the size of that combined SDK. So. Uh so Google Tag Manager and Google, Google Analytics are like one product. They're just two different ways of, of doing uh, things. So we're not going to have a separate SDK at this point. Mm -hmm. Any, so always, the SDK going forward will always include both Google Tag Manager and Google Analytics. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the size. Um, if you're doing development in iOS, for example, mm -hmm. um, the Xcode will strip out all the code that's not that you don't use so your actual final binary will be smaller than you would expect and if you're using something like ProGuard on Android you'll get the same benefit same so even though the SDKs are larger uh, the code that 
you j your app code shouldn't get larger as a result. Mm -hmm. Should be based. As a matter of fact, the iOS SDK, for example, the V3 version is actually smaller than the V2 version. Mm, okay. Even with the Google Tag Manager merge, so then cool. the end result's actually better for you. Cool. All right. So, uh, Jim, any idea on when real-time events will be added to app properties? That's another one. I can say yes. <laughs> we want to do that. We're working on it. I c cannot give you any sort of commitment okay. as to time. So maybe uh, it's coming soon. Maybe. Um, I think we've got time for maybe one more, um, and this is this is a good one. Uh, Jim, this is a plea to you. Can you stop changing <laughs> function names every two months? We'll <laughs> try our best. <laughs> yes, I do apologize for for the the fast pace of changes that we've gone through in, in the last year, but I'm hopeful. Cross our fingers here. I'm hopeful this is the last time we change names, method names like this. Cool. So, and now at least when you're moving from one library to another, for example, if you go from Android to the web. You should see more consistency yes. across how to use each and even language. even Android to iOS. They're, right. they're more consistent now yeah. than they were before. Cool, yes. awesome, cool. So that brings us to the end uh, of this edition of Behind the Code. Um, I wanted to pass on some resources to everybody watching. Um, so we have uh, getting started guides uh, for the V3 SDKs for both Android and iOS. Um, there's a link there. It's basically developers.google.com/analytics. Um, we also have migration guides, um, and these guides cover migrating from V2 to V3, um, or even uh, V1 to V3, so go check that out. Um, we have a mobile app analytics forum. Um, there's a link here. Um, there's a lot of good questions and answers on there. Um, I know uh, Jim's a, an active participant in that forum from time to time, um, so there's a lot of good yeah. insight there. Um, and there is uh, also, if you're wanting to send um, measurement protocol parameters, um, in these SDKs, so we showed you how to do that using that ampersand syntax. Um, we do have a whole parameter reference um, that shows you all the different protocol uh, parameters, so you can go check that out as well. Um, and with that, thank you so much for joining us. That brings us to the end of the show. Um, feel free to uh, reach out to us on Google+, and um, we'll catch you next time. <laughs>